Hello, my friends, and welcome back. I'm not sure if you're like me, but uh, there have been a few books that I've consumed more times than I can count. QBQ, or The Question Behind the Question, is one of those books. This simple, short tome is timeless and has been a staple in my regular reading rotation. In today's victim culture, I think the topic of personal accountability has now become a counterculture idea. And today's guest is the perfect person to lead that culture. John G. Miller is entertaining and engaging throughout the entire conversation. It was a pleasure and an honor to get some time with this lively luminary. In this episode, we discuss personal accountability, how to have it, and some funny moments John has had over the years teaching this important concept. You also hear how John's wife, Karen, feels about being the wife of the personal accountability guy while her name has become synonymous with being a woman who wants to talk to the manager. All this and more on today's Evolved Man. Welcome to the Evolved Man, where we are at war with the mediocrity of modern man. The Evolved Man is for men like you who are willing to be strong, open, and aggressive learners. Men who are not afraid to disrupt and change. It's time we ditch the current conventional idea that we devolve with age, that the dad bod is our destiny, and that the glory days are behind us. Your best isn't behind you, and I'm here to provide you with practical tools, a few tips and tricks, and everyday wisdom to help you evolve into your highest form. Strong, lean, smart, educated, and emotionally intelligent. Now, let's go to war. All right. Well, John G. Miller, thanks for joining me today. Happy to be here, Steve. Thank you. Yeah, great to uh, great to have you. I've been a big fan of your books for several years, uh, and we'll get into those uh, in, in in a bit. But uh, hey, I just wanted to get your perspective on something. So yesterday, I, I saw a video, and the president was holding up a bunch of snacks, and he was talking about the Super Bowl, and he was complaining to America about shrinkflation and how we're now. Time. What's that? <laughs> You saw that too, huh? I did. Uh, yeah, it made me uh, feel several emotions. But uh, anyway, he complained about how we have less chips in the bag and more less cookies in the box. And his biggest frustration was that uh, there's not as much ice cream in the container. Now, given that leaders at all levels in politics and business uh, are doubling down on this blame culture, mm -hmm. how can we start to create a better culture of accountability in our country? Well, that's that's a great question, and without getting into politics, uh, every every POTUS sh should ask, you know, what you and I should be asking. What can I do to make a difference, and how can I help solve the problem instead of pointing fingers? But that's our culture today. That's our world, and that's really the reason I'm a speaker and an author on one idea: personal accountability. I'm a I'm a one note guy, Steve, for. Uh, for, uh, for more than 30 years, that's all we've talked about at QBQ Inc. is personal accountability because it's so badly needed. So how do we change the culture? We don't. We change ourselves. That one golden thread has flowed through many different aspects of your work. Uh, personal accountability. And you've written books on um, you know, parenting and several other things, but personal accountability seems to be that one golden thread that weaves through it. Uh, how did you get into this idea of personal accountability sure. and what sparked it? That's a fair question. I, let me give your uh, your viewers and listeners and your your followers some some background. I came out of Cornell University in 1980, and my wife and I had just gotten married. She was 19, I was 22. We moved out to the Midwest. I worked for a big company, and then we moved around the Midwest to different states for about five years, and I was not happy working eight to five, sitting at a desk. Mm. So uh, one day a friend said to me, why don't you get in sales? And I remember thinking, oh, I can't sell. Uh, well, it turned out I did have that gift of gab. I could sell. And I was I left the company and I found a couple of mentors in the training business who so taught me to sell training. So I went off and started in the Minneapolis, St. Paul area, selling training to managers. So that led me into sitting with management teams for about 10 years and 10,000 hours of just sitting in workshops. And that's when I began to hear 
uh, what I call incorrect questions or lousy questions, if you prefer. Uh, questions like, you know, well, when is that department going to do its job right? And why don't they pay me more? And one day I was reading an article about senior management blaming middle management for not telling them about all the problems in the quality manufacturing process, all the quality problems in the manufacturing process. And the senior management team asked in the article, why didn't those supervisors tell us what was wrong with our manufacturing process? I remember reading that article and thinking, that's the wrong question. A better question would be, what have we done as a senior management team to cause a create a, a culture of fear where our supervisors are afraid to speak up? Yeah. So at that moment, I'll never forget it. I was actually on a treadmill in our home in Minnesota back in 1994. And I thought, well, what is the question behind the question here? The question behind the question. That's the, the phrase I came up with in my mind. And so within weeks, I went out and taught that idea. I said, instead of asking, when will that department do its job right? Why don't we turn it around and ask the question behind the question? How can I be my best today? Well, it's all about personal accountability. And it kind of took off. Clients enjoyed the material. They were using it. So I left my mentors and went off to be a speaker and an author. And here we are 30 years later talking about personal accountability and the QBQ. So in your book, this incorrect question concept, you have dubbed these as IQs. And so your definition of IQ is different than uh, others. Um, why do you refer to them as, I, as IQs or incorrect questions? Well, they're incorrect or they're lousy because they take me to bad places uh, in the QBQ book. And I just, you know, happen to have a copy right next to me, Steve. Hope that's okay. Absolutely. I've got but, several. Oh, thank you so much. Uh, in the book, we we just talk about not asking incorrect questions, which take me to victim thinking, procrastination, and blame. Those are the three traps that we have discovered that all humans uh, suffer from. I, I'm often amazed when some people say, oh, yeah, we don't have any accountability problems. Well, I'll, I'll change that thought. I just spoke the other day in, in Virginia, and and a guy came up to me and said, you know, I thought I was very accountable until I heard your material. And now I realize I've been asking incorrect questions. You know, why don't I get paid more? When will others pull their own weight? Why do we have to go through all this change? And so we were teaching, don't ask IQs or incorrect questions. Do ask QBQs or the question behind the question. So instead of asking, uh, why do we have to go through all this change? The, the accountable person says, how can I adapt to the changing world? So you simple. bring up, yeah, you bring up a, a, an interesting point when you talk about victim thinking, procrastination, and blame. Um, and in your book, you reference that victim thinking not only happens if we're a victim, but it happens more often than not if we're not a victim, mm -hmm. even if we are a victim of something, if someone has taken advantage of us. How do we get out of that? What does it mean to shift from a victim thought process? Well, uh, the QBQ is a self. Uh, it's a thought shaping tool. It shapes the way I think. So it really is about learning. Uh, learning means change. It doesn't mean reading or attending a seminar. It mm -hmm. means changing. So I can change my thoughts. When I've done that, I've learned. So how do we lift ourselves out of victim thinking? First, we recognize I've been playing the victim. And then we start ch changing our thinking by asking, well, what can I do to move forward? How can I contribute instead of whining or blaming or lamenting my circumstances. I mean, uh, the truth is, Steve, life is not fair. <laughs> right, right. We can't control life all around us, you know, but we can control our response to it. And that is not a new thought. John Miller did not invent that idea that we control our thoughts and our response to what happens around us. But we can lift ourselves out of victim thinking by first admitting, like that guy did at the session the other day in, in Virginia, okay, I've been playing victim. I didn't even know it. Now I will start asking, how can I contribute instead of saying, why don't others support me more? The minute we hear that message, we say, you know what? I can change my thoughts. And then that's when I stop playing the victim, or at least not as often. Yeah, I, I like how you say that, not as often. Um, I, I, I saw a video the other day uh, from another speaker who talked about the power of the thought process and how if we continually tell ourselves that we can't do something, if we continue to play this victim, we will eventually believe it. And if we if we say that lie long enough, it becomes a standard belief, uh, very difficult to get away from. And so the QBQ process is not a simple fix for the weekend. Well, well, I used to tell my uh, or I tell my leaders, 
and I tell my clients that I give the book to that you can probably sit down and read the book in in a uh, an afternoon. You can't make the change in an afternoon. Can you walk our listeners through what does it take to shift from an IQ to a QBQ? Incorrect questions tend to start with why, when, and who. So I'll give you a little uh, blurb of content here. The the why questions like, why is this happening to me? Why don't they support me more? Why don't I ever get a break? They take me to victim thinking. The when questions, when will they get back to me? When will management give me more training and coaching? When will somebody clarify my job? When will he give us the vision? They take me to procrastination because essentially what I'm saying is when will someone else take action? Mm -hmm. When will somebody else do something? When they do something, then I'll do something. That's just procrastination. And then the who questions, you know, who dropped the ball? Who missed the deadline? Who made the mistake? That's just blame. As we talk about in the book called Outstanding, 47 Ways to Make Your Organization Exceptional, we talk about stop seeking culprits. And when we ask who dropped the ball, we're not solving a problem. We're just seeking the culprit so we can blame that person. And that's no good. So when we ask all these questions, they take us to these three traps. So what we teach in QBQ, in the book at qbq.com in our engagements is turn the question around and, and build it differently. Begin the question with what or how, put the word I in it, because I can only change me and then focus it on action. So again, I've already you know rattled off a few here. What can I do today to make a difference? How can I contribute? The emphasis is always on what can I do? Not the team, not my boss, not my colleagues. What can I do? That's accountability. It's a very simple yet very disruptive process. I recall several years ago, I had a boss ask me who was at fault for something that had happened in uh, in, in my business. And I understood where she was coming from. I, sure. uh, Like most people, they wanted to affix blame. And I paused and I said, we actually don't ask that question here. What we do ask is the question of what can we do? Now, that doesn't mean that we aren't going to dive in to figure out what the root of the cause was so that we can fix this and address it moving forward. But we don't ask the question of who because that just leads to a blame culture. You can imagine that that went over like a lead balloon in that initial conversation. But over right. time, we got on the same page and she understood where I was coming from. Yeah. It takes a significant amount of courage to begin to ask QBQs in your own life and in the business. What would you say to someone who is just starting out with asking question or the question behind the question? Try it. Try it. It sure beats uh, blame. It sure beats whining. It sure beats feeling sorry for myself. You know, um, I'm a doer. I'm an action oriented kind of guy. If you're into Myers Briggs, I'm an ESTJ. Mm, if, you're in, okay. if you know any, if you know any yep. I'm an A. Uh, I, I get things done. The reason I say all that is I, I tend to lean toward action. However, um, I get frustrated when people don't treat me right. And I get frustrated when clients don't return my calls. And I've been in sales since 86, Steve. I know all about clients not returning calls or prospects right. coming up with excuses not to buy. And if I'm not careful, I want to start whining and complaining about all that. But then I just say, okay. There's a better question here, John. What can I do right now to solve this problem? How can I move forward? It's, it is literally a thought process. That's all it is. It's, it's telling yourself, today, I'm not going to point fingers. I'm not going to complain about my situation. I am going to ask, how can I move forward? And the minute I change that thought, everything changes. My energy changes. My, my emotions change. My actions come. And my, I, that all leads to better actions. It's just a... It's a marvelous little tool that QBQ is. And I, what's fun for me, Steve, and I've already kind of indicated how old I am. I mean, I had like a, a CFO from, I think, Caterpillar contact me a few years ago to speak at a, at a session because he had seen us speak 20 years earlier at Wells Fargo Bank. Now, he, he remembered QBQ, mm. not so much John Miller. He remembered this idea when he was probably, you know, back in the 90s, he was only 30. And the speaker came in and said, hey, let's turn the question around. Let's not blame, whine, or complain. Let's ask, what can I do to move forward? How can I contribute? 20 years later, he's the CFO of a major company. He still remembers the idea, the tool called QBQ. It just sticks with people. I don't know why, but I'm glad it does. I love that. You you refer to what you do when you run into this situation. Uh, given that you've written this book, you've spoken, and you've written many other books, but um, do you ever feel an internal pressure to be perfect relative to your content? 
oh, hey, I've got seven kids. <laughs> that we can just times, leave it right there. I've got seven kids. <laughs> how, many times, how many times over the years have I heard some kids say, Dad, is there a QBQ here for you? <laughs> oh, so, I love that. Yeah, I mean, we all we all slip and I want to get frustrated. Or I feel frustration. I want to yell at somebody, but I don't know. And I developed this idea many decades ago. It's part of our culture. The kids were raised on it. One thing I, I will say is, our kids, of course, are not perfect. We put in the disclaimer like any parent would, but you don't see a lot of victim thinking in our, our seven children. They're very much probably afraid to sound like a whiner. <laughs> I can imagine. Yeah. Around, it, that's not some bad day. external pressure, right? <laughs> yeah, right. But I, I don't worry about being perfect, but if I keep using that QBQ, and I, I will say, I remember, Steve, when I was first developing this material in the mid to late 90s, I was speaking for Land Lakes, the dairy company out of Minneapolis. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I can still remember it was an after dinner talk. And so there were servers coming in and out of the kitchen, still cleaning up tables. And there were 50 executives in front of me. And back then I had a, what's called a DAT, a DAT unit, digital audio tape unit. I was recording myself and I had this antenna sitting on the floor, uh, but I had left it near the door to the kitchen where the servers were coming in and out. And I'll never forget. Oh, so interesting. Yep, some server came through the door and stepped on my antenna, which was on the floor, and broke it. And that was like 1997. And my, I'm proud to say, my first thought was, I should not have left it there. It would have been easy to think, well, she sure was clumsy. Yes. Why didn't she look to see where she was going? Doesn't anybody care about my stuff? But I can remember, I'm up there teaching QBQ. We took a short break. My antenna's broken because she someone stepped on it, and I remember thinking, "Stupid! I should not have left it where I left it." So you could you could go back go back to your opening example, and uh, you know the president of the United States, whether it's Biden or Trump or whoever, could say, "Well, what have I done to create this mess?" Right, right. <laughs> How can I change my policies today? You know, <laughs> but you're not going to see that in politics. No, especially not today. John, one of the things I've I've admired and appreciated about your work uh, over the years is you don't seem to take yourself too seriously, and humor be uh, is something that has been woven into everything that you do. Why is humor such an important part of who you are and how you show up? Well, now I could just say I've been married forty four years. Should we just leave it at that? <laughs> I resonate with that. Uh, my wife, Karen, is actually right around the corner listening to this whole interview. Right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I don't know. You know, I'm the youngest of four, okay. which makes me, which makes me the baby, uh, the class clown. Uh, yeah, you go back to the 60s, Steve, and my mouth ran ahead of my brain then. My mouth runs ahead of my brain now. Uh, I, I, was a, I was hopefully kind of funny as a kid, and I, I, like, I like to say and do funny things. But um, I've had to actually learn over the years as a speaker that the con the audience wants both. They want content and they want humor. It, it's got to be engaging. Yeah. Yeah. You can't be just a comedian because then you're just a comedian. Right. And they're buying, they're hiring you to buy your life changing material called QBQ. But if you just yak at people about being more accountable and there's no humor in there, that can get old. So you just try to mix it up. It's funny you brought that up because I just had a guy who saw me speak recently. And he's, uh, you know, I'm 65, he's 38. So he's just starting his speaking career and his coaching career. He's a coach like you, probably not as good as you, but he's, you know, in that same genre. And he emailed me the other day and he said, I want to be funnier. How did you get funny? And I, my first thought was, is you have to feel funny. Yes. Yes. If, if you don't feel like you're funny, if you don't feel funny, I know it's a strange phrase to feel funny, but if you don't feel funny, you're not going to be funny anywhere. You know, and of course, married 44 years, I'm not funny anymore at home. <laughs> right. It's more about the eye rolling, like, ah. The jokes, the, the jokes have outlived you at that point. <laughs> yeah, something like that. Yeah. Anyway, uh, if you're going to be a presenter in front of an audience, do your best to find some humor. And I will say this as well. Humor only comes by accident. It mm. comes accidentally. Uh, I, I, my mentor, you know, who brought me into this training business back in the 80s and 90s, I once said to Steve, his name was Steve too. I said, Steve, how did you come up with that funny moment, that funny line? He said, I just said it on uh, accidentally one day. 
and they laughed. So I kept it. <laughs> I love that. I've done. I've had the same thing multiple yeah. times. I'll, I'll I'll throw something out there. It'll accidentally uh, get a spark, and I'll say, "Okay, I'm keeping that one." Right. That's right. And every good speaker writes th these things down because you will forget them. So if you're a good speaker, take notes on what you did that day, what worked, what didn't work. How can I be better? What can I do to improve? That's QBQ for speakers. I love that. I w One of my favorite recent stories uh, relative to taking accountability, but also creating some levity was uh, that Ronald Reagan, someone recently found uh, several of his notebooks. And in the notebooks, they were filled with more jokes than almost anything else. Uh, many of them self-effacing, but he yeah. was one of the greatest comedic writers of all time. If uh, if you read through some of his uh, content and yeah. uh, it just he took accountability for the charisma that he needed to have and yeah. for how he needed to show up. I was just blown away by that. Uh, John, you referenced your wife uh, earlier. I'm curious how she feels about your work because, you know, her name, Karen, has over the past few years become synonymous with a negative complaining person, uh, which I'm sure is not her. So uh, how has she responded to this uh, reframing in our society? She will introduce herself to people at times saying, hi, my name is Karen, but I'm not one. <laughs> I love that. And they immediately get what she's saying because this silly Karen thing on online, you know, and all that. But yes. My wife is the last person who would call over the manager to complain about customer service or a bad employee or be demanding or entitled. She is, she is an Enneagram 2, which makes her a server and a helper. She's a former registered nurse. She likes to help people from behind the scenes. I'm, I like to be on, on stage. She'd rather be behind the curtain. So she's a person that, in fact, I, I, I say in my talk sometimes, everybody loves Karen. Yeah. I love that. She's not one of those Karen, Steve. <laughs> I can't imagine. John, a couple of years ago, my family and I uh, had a, had an experience similar to what you referenced in the book where we had a flight delay. Uh, as we sat in the airport for a few hours, uh, we overheard the ongoing spirited back and forth uh, amongst the employees, uh, each trying to affix blame on someone else or on something else. Mm -hmm. and after some time, the pilot came to the terminal and got over, uh, got on the speaker overhead and took full accountability for what was happening. And he essentially said, I am choosing not to fly this plane because of, and he didn't go into great detail. The power of watching someone take personal accountability is really difficult to explain. Um, as you've worked with people, companies, churches, and I, I'm curious to see from your perspective, how has the culture changed as soon as someone takes the reins of personal accountability in their own life? Well, it, it, the organization has a chance to become outstanding then. And I'm, you know, that's the reason, only reason I'm showing Love this that book. book. Yeah is this. There's a story in that book about an Air France pilot who came over the intercom after a long delay and took full personal accountability for the delay, for mm -hmm. the mix, for the mess. And my client who was on that flight, he's a VP with, oh, the clock is going to ding. Sorry. That's fine. That's real life. It's real life. Yep. My, my client who is a Bausch and Lomb eye care executive was on the plane. And when he heard the pilot come on that uh, intercom and take full personal accountability within a day, he emailed us to say, John, I've got a story for you. That's I got to tell you all about this guy who said it's my fault and didn't blame operations or the other airlines or the weather or the flight attendants. It just took personal accountability and I'm talking loud to beat the chimes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but the minute the minute an executive models it, you know, we say in a couple of our books, the parenting book and the QBQ book, modeling is the most powerful of all teachers. And you're a dad, you get that. Uh, they pay the kids pay more attention, of course, to what we do than what we say. But it's the same in business and the same in leadership. When an, when an executive or a manager says, "What can I do differently?" Boy, that's powerful as opposed to some manager out in the field saying, well, that's what corporate said we're going to do, but I don't believe in corporate. They're never getting it right. They don't talk to us. They don't understand us. We're going to do it our way in the face. You know, the minute you hear managers doing that, blaming senior management, you've got a really negative culture. 
See, the human propensity is to blame. I mean, you go back to Adam and Eve and the snake. Mm, yes. <laughs> there's, there's been a lot of blame for a lot of years. This, right. is, not, this is not new. But, but what is new is people that can say, you know what, I'm accountable. Uh, yeah. Meineke hired me once, the franchise franchise company for you know mufflers and car care. And when the CEO contacted me, he hadn't read QBQ. And most of our leads, Steve, come from the people who've read the book. Okay. But he hadn't read the book, but he, he needed a speaker one week out, one week later. And he said, John, a friend of mine told me about your book. I, I, I reached out to you just to ask you, uh, first of all, are you available next Thursday? I said, yeah. Uh, he, and he said, well, can you sum up your... Can you sum up your book in a few words? I said, yeah, I think in about six words. No excuses. I own the result. And he said, well, I've got 600 franchisees coming in, and they tend to blame lack of advertising, mm. location, employees. He said, if that's, your, if that's your message, no excuses. I own the result. You're hired. And one week later, I was in Charlotte, North Carolina, talking to 600 franchisees. There are people out there hungry for accountability. And uh, of course, it always begins with me, me, me practicing it first, because modeling is the most powerful of all teachers. What is it about the human condition that, that uh, sparks this idea that we want to blame someone else when something goes wrong? Sin, man, sin. Talk about that. <laughs> well, my dad was a pastor for 40 years, so I had to go there. <laughs> Uh, he, he was also a Cornell wrestling coach. And, you know, in the book, there's that metaphor about being good enough to beat the ref. Right. Because it's easy to come off from an athletic event and blame the officials. My dad would teach us, nope, it's never about the officials. It's always about what could you have done differently on the mat that night. And so it's just a natural thing to want to blame. I think I think if you want to get uh, less um, theological and more more secular, uh, we blame because we want to protect ourselves from embarrassment. Mm. If you really dig into this, why do politicians lie and cover up and make excuses in front of the camera when they're caught? Why is it so hard to come out in, right off the bat and say, I did it? It's because they are thoroughly ashamed and embarrassed that they got caught doing something, whatever it was, as bad as it was. Yeah. But bring it just the practical level, just the practical level on a daily basis, you know, who likes to be embarrassed? I think embarrassment is personally one of the most powerfully negative emotions that exists in the human world in being embarrassed. And so we're going to, we're going to protect ourselves from that. So, Hey, it wasn't my fault. It was her fault. It wasn't my fault. It was his fault. The minute, as long as I'm pointing outward, I'm going to be less embarrassed because I'm not admitting I did it. Yeah, there seems to be this cognitive dissonance and uh, somewhat of a moral high ground that we take when we look at another person and we can point out their weakness or we can try to place blame. Now, I want to come back to a cornerstone of your QBQ philosophy that I can only change myself. So two questions related to this. First, why is looking for others to change so insidious to our growth? And the second one would be, how can people start to identify the things that they need to personally change? Sure. Well, I can't change others, so don't even try. Right there, bam, mm -hmm. be done. Now, I'm not talking about a parent parenting a nine-year-old. Mm -hmm. We're not saying stop parenting. We're not saying let, let that kid run rampant in the house. If you're a manager, we're not saying, hey, anything goes. No, 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 that's not what we're saying. Even with managers and people, you'd never change the person. You don't change their motivation internally. You don't change right. their desires. You can coach, you can confront, you can fire, you can hire, but you never change anybody else. So just stop now, stop now. How do we identify where we need to change? I think that's as simple as getting a coach. Mm. We've got a whole section in one of our books on the importance of having that third party watching you. When I first started speaking, I asked a guy come, to come audio tape me. Turns out he started saying, you know what? There's some things you're doing on stage you shouldn't, you shouldn't do. What? What are you talking about? I'm amazing. <laughs> I thought I was perfect. Yeah. 
In fact, one night I, I was actually in, in Minneapolis in the 90s speaking with Lou Holtz, if you know the name Lou Holtz. Absolutely, yeah. Football coach, he, you know, he's... So I was on first, Lou was on second, and I thought I'd arrived. I thought that was going to turn into a joke there, John. No, 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 no. I was on yeah. first, Lou was on second. Who was on Who's third? on third? What's on home? What's on? Yeah, it's What's not a baseball joke. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> but anyway, I invited my audio tape paper guy, my AV guy, to come see me speak that night. And he called me the next day. I thought I'd arrived. I was on stage in front of 1,500 people with Lou Holtz, you know. And, and my friend David says, you know what? Um, I can take you higher. And uh, I was so hungry to make it as a speaker that I actually did say, okay. And we met at Red Lobster Restaurant that day for lunch. I wrote him a check and he started coaching me because he could see things that I was saying and doing on stage that I couldn't see. Mm -hmm. 10 years later, he saw me speak in Nashville and I'll never forget, we were leaving the building. He said, hey, wait, wait, aren't you going to ask me what what uh, what you need coaching on? I said, oh, I'm sorry, Dave. Yeah, any, th any thoughts? He goes, no, it was great. <laughs> you have is, arrived. I'm, yeah, I'm not, yeah, I'm not saying you, you arrive or you never need a coach again, but in this one area, David shaped me and helped me remove things that were turning the audience off and do better things that would excite the audience. And I built them into my, I built them into my presentation and they lasted forever. So when he saw me 10 years later, it was like, okay, you're not doing those bad things anymore. So back to your question, how do you discover what you need to change? Ask people. How do you get the transparent um, perspective? I, I I agree with you. I, let me just preface it with, with that. Uh, early in my career, I was so hungry to ask and ask and ask um, that oftentimes people would say, oh, no, no, no you're great. You're great. I said, no, I really want to grow. Can you give me some different perspectives? So if somebody wants to grow, they are asking that question, how can they take personal accountability to maybe eke out a little bit more honesty, a little bit more transparency from the other person? What, what I'm hearing you say is how, how can people swallow their ego and apply what they're hearing? Mm, that could be, sure. That's, that's really huge. Uh, I knew as a speaker, I had the energy and I, and I had humor, a natural base of humor, and, and I had good content, but I, I, I was like play. I needed to be molded and shaped, and only with a coach, a couple external people, could I actually have somebody, you know, come along me by, beside me and say, okay, let's stop doing this. Let's start doing that, and you'll be better, and so we really need that coach. We need that outsider. Now, I wanted to clarify when I say coach, I don't mean you always have to hire a Steve, even though that's great. But my wife can be my coach. Right. Right. My daughter can say, Dad, when you do that, you know, it hurts. Or when you say that, it's not funny, <laughs> whatever. Anybody can give us tips, but I don't know how else to say it. If you don't want to improve, don't ask for advice. I love that. Right. Yeah, why, why, absolutely. why do people ask for help and then not use our advice? Uh, sometimes we have millennial parents around us who will ask for tips. Dad, mom, what do we do at this moment? And we'll give them advice. They don't use it. <laughs> I had a friend that uh, he called it being a, an ask hole when it's a person oh. that continues to ask, but then it just drops into a hole and it never goes anywhere. There you go. And Boy. that's one where I make sure that I pause between those two. Uh, yes, words. yes, because you're a clean guy. Right. You know, we have, <laughs> we have four, see, we have 14 grandkids. And so when we watch all of our offspring parent their offspring, generational differences come into play. Sure. But um, Karen and I have often talked, we got to stop giving tips got to stop giving advice but sometimes nobody's taking it <laughs> yeah it, it it's tough isn't it i i want to i want to uh, hang on the parenting piece for just a second here i mean we we both believe in being active and engaged parents um in fact you and your wife have written a book about it um I, can you talk about your passion for parenting i love that raising accountable kids oh, oh that's you. a that is life changing well thank you it's it's, it's good stuff it's kind of funny um if you go back to 1992, when our kids were nine, seven, you know, 
four and two years old, the original four kids. My wife and I would lay in bed at night till midnight talking about what did we do that day that was right? What did we do wrong? We didn't know back then that we were going to someday write a parenting book because we, because we would discover, Steve, that parenting is a learned skill. Mm. It, it's not something you're just kind of born to do. And that's really one of the problems. You see parents just winging it. Right. And there's no there's no structure. There's no discipline. There's no consequences for choices. They're buying into what their friends are saying on Facebook, which is often wrong. They've taken this thing called peaceful parenting so far that they never get angry with their children. It's okay to be angry with your child. Yeah. yeah. I didn't say hit the child. I didn't say spank the child. Okay. Disclaimer time. But it's okay to be tough on your kids. It's a learned skill to parent. And that's one of the problems is people aren't just, they're not learning the skills of parenting. They're just doing either what they saw their parents do or they're doing what they see their friends do. They're just winging it. And my, Karen and I go back so many years and realize we didn't know what we were doing, but we sure talked about it a lot. We were always looking for a better way to do it, Steve. What can we do differently? We didn't know we were, you know, someday going to write some books about it. It It is a skill. And, and while there are books out there, um, they, the books, I think, I believe can spark an idea. They can give a framework, but then it's really about taking action as you referenced before, jumping in and taking action to become a, a, an active and engaged parent, a parent who takes accountability, a parent who teaches accountability. I, I'm, I'm with you on the tough parenting piece. I think that that's something where I look back and as my kids and I have or excuse me, as my kids have gotten older, there are times where we've had conversations and I'll uh, say, hey, I apologize. I lost my temper during this particular time. There are other times where I'll say, you know what? This is this is what happened. And I'm not uh, sad that I got upset with that because this was not okay. This was not okay. It didn't fit our standards. I will be accountable for what I did. I'll also be accountable for what the response on the other end was based on what I did. Mm -hmm. If you were to give parents one piece of advice that they could take into their parenting toolbox today, what would it be? It's page two. Okay. <laughs> Go read Raising Accountable Kids. No, no, it's, it's, page two. I didn't quite say it that way. That sounds like I'm selling books here. Come on, we wouldn't sell books. <laughs> but on page two, of this book, my wife and I dared to write something that is totally anti-cultural, anti-societal. We wrote, my child is a product of my parenting, mm. period. Mm -hmm. And when, when I share this with groups, people just look at me like, okay, what's the rest of the sentence? Isn't it Donald Trump's fault for how our kids turn out? Isn't it mm -hmm. the politicians? Isn't it Biden's? Is it the church? Social how about media. Social yeah. media, public ad, TikTok. Yeah. No, no. All of those things might influence our children, but as long as we're mentioning all of them, we're not taking full ownership. The only way to take full ownership is to say, my child is a product of my parenting. What can I do differently? And if your kids are raised, what, what did I do that might have caused this in my child? Okay, I, have, I, I did that. I wish I hadn't. Go to that adult child. Talk about it. There's a couple of stories in the book where my wife and I look back and go, oh my gosh, did we really make that mistake? But we've talked to Tara about it, who's now 38. We've talked to Michael about it since he's, he's 35. Mm -hmm. We've talked to them about it. We're not perfect, but we've, we've come to them and said, we're so sorry that that moment happened. It was our bad. What a beautiful thing. And yeah. to, to apologize to a child for something, um, I, I, I think seems to be a lost art. Right, but not apologize to the eight-year-old today right. who's misbehaving and you you told him to stop and he didn't stop, you know, and then you tried to punish him, but then you gave in on the punishment and, and dropped your consequence to her. I mean, don't apologize for being firm because that's what kids need. Right. We're shaping the clay, Steve. We're shaping the clay, right? And it has to be molded. There's yes. got to be pressure in order to mold it. Do it. Well, the world's going to do it if we don't do it. Right. I love that. John, what's your theory on kindness? On what? Sorry. Kindness. Kindness. Oh, I don't know. 
Hey, Karen, am I very kind? <laughs> <laughs> you know, <clears throat> it depends on how you define kindness. Kindness is good. Kindness is good. Uh, I remember a few years ago uh, getting on the train at the Denver International Airport. I was ahead of a woman a little bit and I stopped and I backed up and you do the same thing, Steve. And I said, you first. And she said, well, thank you. And I said, well, I was raised in the 60s. <laughs> I love that. And she was so surprised that somebody on the plane or the train, a business traveler would actually notice her back up, let her on first. It was just like one of those moments like, is this rare to be polite, to mm. be courteous, to be kind? Is this rare? So, uh, you know, we're pretty kind people around here. We're, we're Christian folk and we're not perfect and we're, we try to be nice to people. That doesn't mean that I don't kick the guy off the porch like I did a few months ago who was uh, a sales guy manipulating me, trying to, to get into my house, not tell me what he was selling, fast talking, asking me for a bottle of water. What? Get off my property. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, kindness, I love it. kindness is good. I, you were kind enough uh, several years ago to give one of my employees a few copies of your books. Um, this was probably 15 plus years ago, and uh, which he had returned to uh, to work and shared with others in our organization. Now, at that point, I already had the requirement that everybody had to read QBQ as one of the three books in order oh. to work for me as a manager. Thank uh, you, Steve. You're so kind. They, thank you. <laughs> Now this this experience combined with other stories in your books and and uh, other speaking events that I've seen online, uh, I I think just highlight how magnanimous you are with people that you meet. Our society seems to have a massive gap in connection from online to in person. We don't pe treat people uh, in person the same way because we have I believe we've lost the art of that. And we're mm -hmm. online all the time. So let's say that someone is struggling to make new connections, new friends. What can they learn from you in your example? Oh, well, that's very nice of you. I would say, well, first of all, don't be a jerk. You know, <laughs> that that's I, it. I love how it we we we're done. All right, we're, we're done. Done. Good, yeah. good interview. Steve. You know, we're 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 conservatives here, and we have our political views. But if you come to my QB or my Facebook page, my John Miller Facebook page. If I ever post a question that leads to a political discussion, I, I'll be honest with you, Steve, you'll never you'll never see me attacking the other person, mm. name calling. Part of it, I will say, is not because I'm just so magnanimous, magnanimous, but because, you know, I'm a salesperson. Uh, people buy QBQ books from all walks of life. Democrats buy QBQ books, Republicans buy QBQ books, atheists, agnostics, Christians, Mormons, Catholics, they all buy QBQ books. Mm -hmm. Last thing I want to do is, you know, drive some, some group away. So if you follow me on Facebook, people that don't even agree with me, don't agree with me on politics, they stay on my page, they stay my friend because I never, I'm not going to call them a name. Mm. Yeah, you know, I might I might say appreciate you sharing, but I'm not going to call you a jerk because you don't agree with me. So back to your connection or your connection question. My golly, people, come on, let's let's be kinder, let's be nicer to people online, and then you know maybe we'll build a following. It, it's something that I think is really important in in person, uh, in particular, to to learn how to disagree with somebody, and still. Uh, have a great relationship. I feel like that today we have gotten away from that. Um, yeah. How can a person take full accountability for a relationship and making sure that the, the relationship fosters and flourishes? Well, back to your first point, the, the problem with social media, and my wife and I actually will say this sometimes, we wish it had never been created. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you go back, we left Minnesota in 1997 Steve, and there was, there was no social media then. Internet was around. I had just gotten email in 96. Mm -hmm. We look back at our neighbors in Minnesota. We have no clue where they stood politically. Mm. Good point. No, no clue. Good point. It was Tim across the street, and there was Joey down the street, 
and there was there was George next door. They were just neighbors. We all talked to each other. Nobody fought over anything, but because there was no social media, we just weren't aware of their views. I wouldn't mind going back to that world. Yeah, yeah. Wouldn't that be nice? It would not, be. We don't we don't have that divisiveness. Yeah. We, yeah. We don't need to know everything you're thinking. Right. I mean, I know this is not a new phrase. My son actually first said it to me 10 years ago, the, the, the keyboard warrior, the laptop warrior, the person who sits at their computer and attacks people and says anything they want because it's safe. I always ask myself this, if they were at Starbucks sitting there with that person over coffee, would they say the same thing? Right. Uh, I, right. Have a strong, I, I have a strong belief. My family knows that I can never win an argument on Facebook. End of. Done. Can mm. never never win an argument on Facebook. So those are some of my social media views. What was your question? Yeah, really, the question is, how do we create more of that connection at, in person? I mean, we, we've we gotten to the point where we have created this divisiveness yeah. online, but how do people um, create connection in person? What, what what's oh. How do we take accountability for that? I, I'm not an expert in this because I pretty much don't need friends and I stay home a lot. Oh, good. Thank you. Okay, but... <laughs> When I'm not traveling, I'm just in this house. But obviously, we all know when you're with someone, it is much harder for the average person to be mean and nasty and vindictive and, and cruel with their words. It's so much harder. I've often thought if a far left liberal and a far right conservative were stuck in an elevator for eight hours, in, you know, in the same building, stuck in that elevator for eight hours, is there a chance they might become friends? Yes. Absolutely. You know, because then we realize everybody's human. And I'm not going to give you some sappy story about everybody's human. Okay. I'm not going to really talk about that anymore. I'm just saying if we were with people, we probably would be a little kinder to them than we are online. Yeah. So accountability, it's it all comes back to what can I do to change me? How can I model humility for others? You know, we talk in the QBQ book, humility is the cornerstone of leadership. If, if you're not going to come across humble, you you might come across arrogant. Arrogance repels, humility attracts, big difference. Sometimes we have managers say, how can I pull my team together and draw people to me? Well, make sure there's no big braggadocious, you're all about you, uh, arrogance. Make sure it's uh, you, you're you displaying humility to your team. How can I improve me, everybody? Ask your team. You know, it's kind of like with the QBQ book. I had a pharmaceutical manager once who came up and said, boy, did I do it wrong. I said, what did you do wrong? She said, I bought 10 QBQ books for my team and I handed them out and said, you need these. <laughs> and yes. so I said, well, here's what you do next time. When you hand them out, you say, you know what, uh, everybody, I've read this book three times. I'm working on me. I need to apply this. Please come up to me later and let me know how I'm doing. After you've read it, let me know how I'm doing. I love that. And of course, then they'll read it thinking they're going to critique the boss, but then what will happen? They'll realize, oh, wait, this is for me. Yeah. Anyway. It goes to know, that story that you talk about in the book of uh, accountability starts with you, right? Yeah, right. The CEO. <laughs> who, yeah. I, I spent an hour and a half talking about, I can only change me. And he gets up and shows a PowerPoint that says, accountability begins with you. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> John, I understand that Dave Ramsey and I have one thing in common. Uh, I, I too, require that anybody that works for me reads QBQ. Uh, and I often recommend it to people I speak to and or coach. Um, wh why does Dave require his staff to read it? Well, if you don't know Dave Ramsey, he's all about getting out of debt, managing your money, personal finance. He's based out of Nashville. He's on the radio 15 hours a week, three hours a day. And he found the QBQ book in the Memphis airport years ago, read half of it standing there, then felt so guilty, he thought he should pay for it. So he bought the book <laughs> and then he That's got a hold a of me. Story. Right. He got a hold of me and had me on had me on the shelf. But I, I say all that for this, for this reason. He would tell you this. You cannot get out of debt. You cannot manage your money well unless mm -hmm. you take personal accountability. So Dave is all about personal responsibility, ownership, personal accountability. I mean, come on, let's think about it. Somebody says, well, you know, the credit card company keeps sending me credit cards and upping my limit. That's why I bought a new couch. Mm -hmm. Obviously, that's a dramatic example of, you know, most people wouldn't say that. But until you take accountability, you're not going to control your spending and get out of debt and save for the future. So 
That's all. Dave Ramsey's all about accountability. He just happened to find a book called QBQ that put it in the right framework for him. So he decided to have me on the show a few times and recommend it to his listeners. That's wonderful. Uh, a quote I, I believe that's attributed to Albert Einstein reads that any intelligent fool can make things bigger and more complex. It takes a touch of genius and a lot of courage to move in the opposite direction. Uh, it, your book is uniquely profound and short. I often tell people that I recommend it to that they could sit down and read it in an afternoon for the first time. Uh, talk about how you cut it down to reveal the essence of what is necessary and nothing else. Stop trying to change others. There you go. That's pretty simple. You, you don't even need to read QBQ now. <laughs> yeah, right. Don't buy the book. Uh, it's funny. I had a mentor in the training business who was also an author, but now he's 20 years ahead of me in life. He's 85. He used to say that um, compl complicating training is one of the worst things you can do in an organization. He used to talk about, in the, of course, nothing new, keep it simple, stupid, and all that stuff. But he would teach principles and then let people figure out how to apply them. Now, we're teaching personal accountability. Yeah, we're giving you a tool. QBQ is a three-step tool. You know, the question begins with what or how contains an eye, focuses on action. But you've got to decide, you know, where to go apply it. We've had people come to us and say, I'm a nurse. Can you write a QBQ book for nurses? Nope, because QBQ applies everywhere. You don't need it. It doesn't have to be applied to a specific profession. It's just that fundamental. Ask better questions, get better answers. So I was raised up in the training business by a guy who did not believe in complicating training. And so here we are all these years later. I think our material does the same thing. It keeps it simple. It has a significant timelessness to it. Um, and John, final question for you. I mean, I, I, I genuinely fear for not only today's generation, but the next generation because of this victim culture that we're seeing yeah. uh, pervasive in all aspects of life. Um, as someone who's so passionate about accountability and QBQ, how can we fight against the victim culture and create a bigger culture of honor and accountability? Starts with me. I don't know what else to say, Steve. It sounds glib. I mean, I can give you all kinds of examples of the problems we're seeing in this culture. I was talking to a Dairy Queen manager. She's, I said, what's it like working with teenagers these days? He goes, oh, well... If I put them on a three-hour shift, they're okay, mm. but, but nothing longer. I said, why? Busy? Schoolwork? Athletics? Sports? Are they in the orchestra? She said, no, they can't stay off their phones that long. So there you go. We're dealing with a whole generation. No, that's too broad a statement. We're dealing with a generation where there are some people who either don't want to work, haven't been taught the value of work, don't need to work because mom and dad give them everything they want. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, there's all kinds of entitlement out there. We got a government handing out stuff left and right. Right. But it all begins with me, Steve. What can I do to change John Miller? How can I be more accountable today? What can I do to show humility to my friends and family, people online that follow me? Just it starts with me. It's just so simple. P Dave Ramsey, funny you mentioned Dave. He always ends the interviews with John. What's the number one takeaway from uh, from uh, your QBQ material? And I always tell him the same thing. I say, Dave, it's I can only change me. So ask yourself, who you've been trying to fix lately? Stop it now. Stop it now and start with you. Yeah, that's right. Well, the man is John G. Miller. The book is QBQ, uh, several other books, outstanding and, and, and many others that you can find. Uh, John, if people listen to this episode and if for some reason they have not heard of you, they don't know about these books, where can they find more information? Simple. So simple. QBQ.com. I always laugh because we used to give out 800 numbers and addresses and qbq.com. I've had that URL now since 1998, Steve. That's wonderful. And it's uh, just come there. You can find out everything about us and join our email list and buy books and learn about our family, all those things. Well, John G. Miller, thank you again for coming on to the show. Uh, it's been an thank honor. You. Like I mentioned, I've uh, loved your work for several years. So great to get a chance to sit and uh, chat with you today. Thank you, Steve, very much. All right. Thanks for joining me today for this episode of The Evolved Man. 
If you're learning from and gaining value from this podcast, please subscribe to the Evolved Man newsletter where I can support you even more in your personal evolution. I want to help you reverse engineer your success. The Evolved Man newsletter is like getting a free coaching session to keep you moving forward on your path of personal success. Go to the evolvedmanpodcast.com to sign up today. If you found value in this episode, you can give us up to a five-star rating on Apple and Spotify and share it with your network. That's the best way to support the podcast so we can continue to get great guests and provide you with the best wisdom for your daily life. Until next time, keep evolving.